kan je, uh, wil ik ook maar af. Ik will speak with the servant boy. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a lonely place by themselves. Now many saw them going and knew them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great throng, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And then from verse 53. And when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran about the whole neighborhood and began to bring sick people on their pallets to any place where they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and besought him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. May God bless our reading, understanding, and doing of his word. Amen. We continue to read also from 2 Samuel chapter 7, from verse 1 to 14. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, He said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, This is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now, I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word to us. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, we pray. Amen. So for the next uh, few weeks, or when I'm preaching, I'm not sure how the other preachers might be led, I'm going to be talking a little bit about worship. And uh, you might think, oh, worship, that's playing the guitar and singing. That's what Gus loves doing. And that's true. I do love playing the guitar and singing. And if you give me half a chance, I'll probably do that all day. So I try not to. But one of the things that helps me to think about what worship is, is to put the words worth and ship together. 
to think about what something's worth. I find it quite fun, you know, when you find that, that lacquer pair of undies on the shelf, but it doesn't have a price tag. And then you set to yourself, okay, I'll buy these if they're 50 bucks. And you head over to one of those little scanny things, and you scan it, and it's 250 bucks, and you drop it in that little basket where all the other stuff is that people didn't want because it was more expensive than they decided. As I was thinking about that, I also thought about this morning when I, when I woke up. I wake up very early, and some people might think it's because I'm industrious and hardworking. It's not. It's because I'm like Winnie the Pooh. I have a grumbly in my tumbly. And I, and I sit there considering the value of my nice warm bed versus some nice warm porridge and coffee. And I sit there going, hmm. And I get to the point where the hunger is more than the warmth, and then I've decided that I'm going to head off in that direction. So I have standards, and some people would rather sleep than eat. I would rather eat than sleep. And I've heard of people who cook and eat and, sli and sleep all at the same time. It's a phenomenon called sleep cooking, but that's maybe not the point. I wish that I could develop sleep cleanings. Wouldn't that be cool? You just wake up and your house is clean. Oh, man. Maybe, maybe you could pray for the gift. So worship is about setting the right value on the right things. Getting your priorities in order. And we have interesting sets of values that we, we live by. One of the interesting things I always think of is this whole notion of, you know, if someone's at work and then there's a kid's hockey match and they bunk off from work to go watch the kid's hockey match. I have flexible time, so I don't consider it bunking. But then you might say, oh, you're stealing office time. How dare you? But then on another day, on the Saturday morning, the office will say, oh, Microsoft crashed last week. You need to come in today. And we'll happily steal family time for work. And our, our world makes that right to do because we put the wrong prices on the wrong things. We value money more than relationships. We, what do they say? We use people and love things rather than love people and use things. I mustn't get that mixed up because then it sounds bad. You think about something that Jesus said. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well, from Matthew 6, verse 33. It's about getting our priorities straight, seeking God's kingdom and righteousness first, asking ourselves, what would God want for me? What is God's highest value? What value does God place on this time, on this thing? What value does God place on my cozy bed and my warm porridge? How do I make my, decide, my decisions? based on values that God has set. And so worship invites us to get our priorities right. And if we carried on, I'm always impressed that you're here on a Sunday. I don't know if it's the tea or, or uh, maybe it's Sela in his deep voice. Um, or maybe it's that you've come to reset. You've come to say, uh, if I carried on without setting back and looking at, at, at God for a minute, then my values will get out of hand and I'll forget what was most important. I sometimes say I'm really glad it's my job to be here on a Sunday because I'm sure I would sometimes choose having a second bowl of porridge or climbing back into the warm bed than come to church, but I don't have a choice. I have to be here nice and early. In each of our worship services, we normally start with some sort of call to worship. And some preachers will, will choose a psalm. I like to choose a song because I find that you all pay a bit more attention to a song. And as you sing, great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, I hope that something in you says, oh, yes, God is faithful, God is good. Let me remember God. And if you're ADHD like me, you're thinking, great is thy faith. Did I have toast when I get home? Some marmalade or jam? Because I don't always call myself 
to worship as much as I ought to. One aspect of being called to worship is not just to adjust the values we've attached to the things in our lives, but to remember that we are called into God's presence. We read from Samuel 2, from 2 Samuel chapter 7, David's thoughts about what God wants for him. He's lying there in his lacquer house made of cedar. He's uh, gone and spent, spent his money making sure he's got a lacquer palace to impress his neighbors. Then suddenly, it's a bit late now, don't you think? He thinks, ooh, what about the Ark of the Lord? It's just in a tent. He wants to build a temple, a place where God can live. At first, the prophet Nathan says, go ahead and do it. But then in the night, God speaks to, to Nathan and says, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent in the tabernacle. A reminder from God that he has not abandoned his people. That God doesn't need a place to live or a space. But we do have a desire in our hearts to frame a place where we understand that God is. Is this church building a place where God is particularly present? Or is God more present in a beautiful and tall St. George's Cathedral during my leave time? Sure. Not only did I wake up early to get my porridge, but I also managed to get myself and Heather to St. George's Cathedral for the 7 a.m. Uh, communion service. And uh, I like that because then it's done with before the rest of the day. That's rude, Gus. It's not the Lord's hour, it's the Lord's day. But as I stood in that beautiful building and looked at the stained glass windows and I was standing next to Desmond Tutu's, um, what do you call it? Uh, where they put his, his ashes, his, his ossuary. I don't know, what, what, I've lost the name for that thing. I was moved to tears, actually. I was just standing there kind of crying quietly because I was just moved by the beauty of this place and the sense of presence and purpose. And, and maybe I was moved by the cathedral or maybe I was moved by what the cathedral reminds me of, the importance and the presence of God. We have this impulse to have a place where we can go and meet with God. And it's not a bad impulse but it's not theologically accurate. It is psychologically helpful. It is psychologically helpful for me to get up from my bed with my porridge and my coffee, and if it's warm enough to go and sit on my stoop in a little holy place where I eat my porridge and drink my coffee before my children have started to make a noise. Sometimes it's even before the birds wake up, and sometimes the, ro the rain is falling on that corrugated roof, and it sounds so lacquer and loud, and you just feel like there's some holiness in this moment. And that's become my little holy place. With my porridge and my coffee before the rest of my family wake up, I, I find my, my still point and I'm able to deal with getting lunch ready and all the chaos of getting children to school on time in the morning. <laughs> Shame, man. Poor children. But out by the, car, by the couch, my heart is more open to God and I become more aware. In order to realize that God is present in the kitchen where, where I try to remember which kid to give lunch to and uh, to remember to unpack the dishes, we, we share the, the load at home. Uh, Heather's here, so I can't say too much about how much I do. Um, I would like to say that I do the bulk of the work, but that wouldn't be true. If David had built the temple, it would have become more of an idol than it would eventually become a, a symbol of God's presence because Jeremiah prophesies against the temple. He says, you, you go robbing and 
and, and, and you treat people unjustly and then you cry, the temple, the temple, the temple, because you think that the, the, the locality of the place makes you holy, but it's not the locality of the place, it's your actions and, and the way that you live. And so Nathan tells David not to build that temple. But he says words that, that we understand in two different ways as he speaks about building a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I'll raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. As we read that, we, we realize that what God is talking about through the prophet Nathan is Solomon, who, who will build the temple. But then the language says, he will establish, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. We understand through the New Testament, that this is about the kingdom that will be built through the great descendant of David, Jesus. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. We realize that the promise of the presence of God is not fulfilled in a building of bricks and mortar, but in Jesus, who is flesh and blood. So we are called, come, come, come to this place of worship, come and, and, and be present in the presence of God. And then we wonder what kind of call to worship would Jesus give us? Now, as I look for a psalm that calls us to worship, my favorite ones are the ones where clap your hands, all you peoples and, and the mountains bow down and the, the skies sing forth and the thunder claps and I come like, wow, that's big stuff. Then I realize that Jesus' call to worship is given to us in Mark 6.31. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. I'm so caught up in a call to worship that's about me doing something. About me jumping up and singing the loudest. About me putting on the best show. That I forget that the call to worship that Jesus gives me is to come into his presence. To come into that healing space where the world is put back in order, not because I put it in order, but because when I rest in his presence, he starts tidying things up in my soul, starts unpacking my internal dishwasher, putting the dirty dishes in and whatever needs to happen in there. As we read Mark's chapter 6, we'll realize it's quite a busy chapter and we've just skipped past the part where he feeds the 5,000, etc. because we're just focusing on this thing that Jesus does. He calls people to come and be present and healed in his presence. Mark 6, 3, he gets thrown out of his hometown. The people take offense at him. He then sends out the 12 to do ministry from village to village, taking no bread, no bag, no money, not even a cell phone. And we read in verse 13 that they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. It's been an emotional roller coaster. We've reflected on rejection at Nazareth, healing and exorcisms, Herod's threats as we think about how Herod chopped off the head of John the Baptist. And we realize that the disciples need a break. And then Jesus says to them, come. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Every Sunday at the beginning of the hour of worship or every day or every second and minute, we should hear that call of Christ to us. Come. Get some rest and some restoration and healing in my presence. Sometimes God calls us to get a kick in the backside. 
that often God calls us to get some rest. And to be able to handle the chaos that's coming just now. Because of the rest that we have in him. And as we read what we read in Mark chapter 6, we see these people being called aside to get some rest. We see Jesus even trying to get away on his, his boat to go and get some peace and quiet. But wherever he goes, the people follow him and they come and they say, can you, can you help us? Can you help us? And then we realize that we are, are not as appreciative of God's call to his presence as we should be. Many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. Just so hungry and, and eager to be in the presence of Jesus, so hungry and eager and aware of their need that they rushed there on foot from far away to find Jesus and his presence. Again, in 54 to 55, and next week I'll dim out the background a bit so you can actually read it. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. I think that I, I think that we have taken his presence for granted, haven't we? right there. A prayer away, a breath away, a, a moment away, a, a cry out to God in a time of need. We don't have to gather up the sick on mats and run from here to there. In fact, we can visit the sick and we can pray for them in their beds. We can bring Jesus to them wherever they are. We are being called to worship, to realize God's presence. To realize he is with us. That's part of what we worship on a Sunday. It's not that God is here at Janssen Road, number 85, I think. Or God is next door. Or God is at a church down the road. But that we mark time and space and say, I need to reconnect with my God. And then during the day, establish a rhythm that says God is here and I am with him. Come, says Jesus. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Amen. Lord God, we don't always pay attention to your presence. We are more aware of, of what's going on around us than what's going around on inside us. We're more aware of our relationship with others. We're more aware of whether we're making ourselves happy or sad than we are of whether you are with us. You never abandon us or forsake us. You are always there, O oh God. And so help us like those people of old to rush by foot in any way possible to, to, to become aware of your presence. Help us to establish those rhythms and habits of thought that look for you first and rush to you. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. We want to see you. We want to see you in the peace and quiet, but we also want to know that you are there in the chaos and the storm. Pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to be more present and aware of you. As we lift up this prayer to you, we also pray for the world in which we live. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would guide our government, that you would guide our church, that you would guide all leaders in business and in life. And you would help us to do as you have called us to do. So we pray as you, Jesus, have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Let's stand as we sing, It is well with my soul, when peace like a river attendeth me.